Hey guys, and welcome back to another Lost Bits video right here on Tetrabit Gaming, the series where we explore video game content that goes unused, altered, or normally unseen. Ah, SpongeBob SquarePants. Now this has always been one of my favorite cartoons, if not favorite shows ever. And touted by many as being the best SpongeBob video game, it's no surprise that fans are hyped for the Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated Remake. And this is also a video many of you have been requesting for a very, very long time, so I really do hope you enjoy. Before we start though, just want to give a quick shout out to the Minus World channel. If you don't know, me and a bunch of my other YouTube pals are uploading there quite often now. We compete against each other in challenges, talk about stuff, and just fart around. So if you're interested, be sure to swing on by. The link to the channel will be down at the top of the description. Anyways, with all of that said, go grab your spatulas. It's time to dive into Bikini Bottom to find some lost bits. Alright, so before we get to the final release of the game, let's first have a look at the demo of the game that was found on a PS2 kiosk demo disc. You know, like the ones you could play at Walmart or whatever back in the day. So the only notable difference in this version here comes in the form of the save icons that are used. I'll throw them up on screen here so you can compare them with the ones that went used in the final game, and as you can see, basically all of them not only appear in lower quality, but also from an earlier build of the game, featuring either earlier boss health bars, different looking layouts, or even an unused phase from the Spongebob Steel Pants fight, which we'll come back to later. Also, since there's not too much to talk about, as a small bonus, let's throw the uh, Game Boy Advance version of the game in here too, for good measure. This version only has two unused graphics. First, a crude programmer art placeholder graphic for a door, warp, and DLG, which is thought to be an abbreviation of dialogue. And secondly, there are graphics that make up this animation of Hans, with flames coming out the back. Huh. Talk about nautical nonsense. Alright, now on to the final version of the game for the original Xbox, PS2, and GameCube. Now if you know anything about this game's unused content, you may know that there is a lot of it, so let's get slapping. Let's first kick things off with some unused graphics. We got these early unused button textures, this on flag, this pink backdrop meant apparently for some cinematic, the button here in this texture is also never used, then there's this early unused version of the X icon used for things that can be bubble bashed. There's this temporary placeholder graphic with the word temp right on it, pretty self-explanatory. Then we have these two unused text box graphics, this tile set which based on the name looks like it was meant for the throw fruit and would feature different fruits and their leaves. Then there's this purple rock texture found amongst the files for the rock bottom area. There's some unused arrows graphics that's apparently related to slides. And then there's this texture for Muscle Spongebob that's mostly unused. Now I say mostly because apparently some parts of it are actually used for the eyes of Spongebob Steel Pants during the final phase of that fight. Next are several graphics left over from an earlier version of the game's menu and heads up display. First are these spatulas, as well as this early version of the shiny objects, both of which were replaced with 3D models in the final game. There's this small bubble, a Krabby Patty, an anchor that was actually later reused in the SpongeBob SquarePants movie game. Then we have these pineapple textures that were replaced with the jellyfish. There's this early version of the underwear health graphic that could also be seen in some early gameplay footage and screenshots of the game. We have this bubble meter believed to have been intended to be used with Spongebob's bubble attacks. And lastly is this outline sketch of Spongebob as well as something that would apparently fill it in. Unfortunately it isn't Doodlebob, talk about missed opportunity. What exactly this was intended for or what would have caused the graphic to be colored in is currently unknown. And last for the unused textures is actually a graphic of I guess a mock-up credit roll. This was obviously a joke by the developers, as this is a far cry from any traditional credit roll, with the rolls all being a play on words, like an art detector, a lead promlem, a gay designer, and a lead animosity. Yeah, word indeed. Next up, now onto some animations that are normally never seen in the game. All unused, we have this goofy looking walking animation for Plankton, this idle animation for Robo Patrick, and similarly an idle animation for Robo Spongebob. 
Then for Sandy, we have an unused animation of her doing some push-ups found amongst the files for the SpongeBob's Dream Stage, as well as an animation of Sandy losing her footing. This one too is meant for and used in the unused phase in the SpongeBob Steel Pants fight, but again, later. Then we got this unused animation of the mime meant for when the player would attack him, this early version of the attack animation for Ham Murr, these unused walking animations for Squidward, Mr. Krabs, Gary, Larry, and Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy. There's also this unused animation of Mermaid Man running away from something out of fear. And in a similar fashion, there's this unused animation of Mrs. Puff walking in which she too looks pretty scared. Then next are a few unused animations for Bubble Buddy. There's once again another walking animation, as well as two more idle animations in which Bubble Buddy appears to be waving and jumping for joy or something. Finally is this long boy, titled Worm underscore Bind. This textureless model is found amongst the files for the Shady Shoals area, and once again can be hacked into the game. Once hacked in, it's also revealed that it too has several associated unused animations, these being two separate idle animations, one for walking, as well as one for being attacked. Since this model has what looks like a leash around it, it's believed that this is Mr. Doodles. You know, Mr. Krabs' pet worm from that one episode. Yeah, you know the one. So we went over some unused animations, but now let's bring it around town to the models that are normally unseen. First are two unused Goo Lagoon model variants of these fish NPCs. That's got to be the most goopy T-pose I think I've ever seen. Then we have this unused shiny object collection box where the player was once planned to drop off the shiny objects. This was replaced by clams in the final version. And speaking of the shiny objects, there's also this unused row of them and they're labeled too in case you didn't know what they were. The orange model of this row can actually be seen in this early image of the game's hub area too. Then there's this unused exit sign meant for Sand Mountain, this taxi model with some messed up texturing, well, half of this model is seen in the game's taxi stops, but here we can see it in its entirety. Then there's this unused model of a smelly Sunday. Now this was actually once intended to be a power-up in the game, and it was even seen in some pre-release footage. Surprisingly, it turns out that this item can still be hacked into the game, and its intended effects too are left over. As seen here in this footage by Fun Lunde, I probably butchered that, I'm sorry. The power-up would allow Patrick or Spongebob to run faster and destroy basically all enemies with only one basic attack, all while leaving behind a cloud of subpar smelling breath. Though it would only have lasted for about 10 seconds, it is still believed that this power-up was removed for being too powerful, and I suppose unnecessary. I think it's too bad though, as it's another nice reference to a classic episode of Spongebob. Then moving along, there are these graphics of stuff on a shelf meant to be seen inside of Spongebob's kitchen. And these aren't actually unused, but rather unseen, as they can surprisingly still be found outside of the kitchen if you hack the camera. It looks pretty messed up, but here they are. As such, it is thought that they are either just misplaced by the developers, or maybe they were just moved last minute. Next are several more early models that were updated for the final release. There's this early hint sign featuring Gary. Gary was eventually replaced by just a question mark. Sorry, fella. Meow. Then there are these early models of the Thunder Tiki as well as the Flying Tiki. Now, although the large lips were removed, the Flying Tiki that is used interestingly still carries the name Tiki Lovey Dovey. Next is this push button featuring the push texture we went over earlier. Then there's this early toll gate as well as this early version of the Thick. <laughs> raft guy, where he was seen wearing green pants, as well as a shirt that's identical in color to his skin. This must have been changed since it's very hard to tell that he's even wearing a shirt. Then we have this unseen clarinet meant for who else but Squidward, and finally there's this soccer ball. Wow, a soccer ball that goes unused. Haven't seen that before. Anyways, this soccer ball was actually reworked into the watermelon throw fruit. This soccer ball was also seen in several early screenshots of the game too. Now I mentioned the shelves that are found just outside of Spongebob's kitchen, but there are actually several other instances of objects being found hidden away from normal view. Now many of these are featured in the Boundary Break episode made by She Says, so I encourage you to check it out for all of them, but I'll go over some of my favorite ones here. First are these two tikis hidden away behind this lodge in Sand Mountain. 
And Barnacle Boy can be found inside the Mermelair computer? Now this I find very interesting. The Barnacle Boy inside the computer here is actually the object that speaks to you when interacting with the computer. It's pretty strange. Then there's this model of a shipwreck found underneath the Flying Dutchman's graveyard that is never seen even when the lake is drained. This is actually the same model that's found right above it here, so it's pretty strange why it's duplicated down there. Lastly are hidden duplicatotrons, several of which are underground, hidden duplicates of the ones found above ground. Huh. Duplicate duplicatotrons. Go figure. This is the case in Sandy's Dream here, in the downtown area here, as well as in Sand Mountain here. Let's keep things going. Now let's first check out some unused audio files of which there is a lot. First are several unused sound effects. I'll quickly just play through them all here. <laughs> then we have numerous unused dialogue recordings for SpongeBob, Sandy, and Patrick, and these range from the characters seeing enemies, to Patrick's reaction to being at the top of Jellyfish Fields, an area that in the final game it's impossible to use him in. Now there are just way too many of these dialogue lines to play through all of them here, so in the interest of time, I'll just play through some of my favorites. He's only big if you think he is. <laughs> I like bubbles. Hard as a rock. Oh, don't look down, Patrick. Don't look down. <gasps> I look. You're just a bag full of jelly. That's the orriest robot yet. Well, don't that beat all. Gotta watch out for the boom. Oh, I'm being shanghaied! Watch the tentacles! Ouch! If you're interested in hearing the rest, I'll leave a link to the Cutting Room Floor article where you can give them a listen. Similarly, there are several bits of dialogue that do go used, but unused alternate takes of them are left over. These are left over for SpongeBob, Patrick, Sandy, Mr. Krabs, Squidward, and Mrs. Puff. Again, I won't play them all, just some of the ones that I found more interesting than the rest. SpongeBob to Mission Control, the launch is a go. SpongeBob to Mission Control, the launch is a go. Howdy, Mrs. Puff. Howdy, Mrs. Puff. Don't ask questions you aren't prepared to handle the answers to. Don't ask questions you aren't prepared to handle the answer to. I always thought the gym was trained. I thought the gym was already trained. With the unused audio out of the way, time for everyone's favorite, some unused text strings, yay. First are text references to some unused items, a bus ticket, a stall key, as well as a Sunday, likely the one we went over earlier. Then there are some early names for some of the stages in the game, and several text strings related to a completely different game, Scooby-Doo Night of a Hundred Frights. Heavy Iron Studios, who developed Battle for Bikini Bottom, also developed that game, so it's no surprise that these are probably left over from developing Scooby-Doo. The text leftovers include all of the mission names from the Scooby-Doo game, a message asking the player to insert the Scooby-Doo game disc, and then exclusive to the Xbox version of Battle for Bikini Bottom, there's this long string of text, again referencing stuff from the Scooby-Doo game. Next are several scrapped dialogue messages from several characters. These include Bubble Buddy appearing in SpongeBob's dream, Squidward in Mr. Krabs' dream, Larry in Sandy's dream, an extended dialogue bit when SpongeBob interacts with the box office guy, unused lines for Patrick, early placeholder lines for Larry, Bubble Buddy, and Mrs. Puff meant for and used in the early version of the Goo Lagoon level, Similar early text for the Flying Dutchman, and then my favorite, some unused lines for Bubble Buddy. Now these seem very uncharacteristic of Bubble Buddy, and these are believed to have just been written in by a bored programmer. Next is some normally unseen log text that is printed whenever you collect underwear, lose all of it, or respawn after drowning. This string reads, decrement time equals zero, ass saved. Y yeah uh... Totally. And surprisingly, that's not the only non-G-rated text string in this game. The player asset that's loaded into memory at the start of the game is literally just named this. 
And lastly, although not exactly unused text per se, there are several normally unseen configuration values. These include some cheats that I guess could have been toggled by the developers for debugging purposes, like being able to switch between characters on the fly by pressing a direction on the D-pad, being able to toggle flying around, disabling forced conversations with NPCs, some sort of spongeball cheat, and one dealing with portals. There are also leftover configuration settings for the Sunday power-up, which obviously go unused since that item is also unused. These are to configure the power-up's duration, as well as what I assume is maybe the factor that the power-up was to increase the character's attack power by. And finally, once again, are several configurations left over from the Scooby-Doo game. So I mentioned some early unused menu graphics earlier, but surprisingly many of these can actually still be seen in the game, as an early version of the menu can be hacked in by swapping some files. When loaded in, it will annoyingly overlap the normal pause menu, but as we can see here, it contains some pretty interesting stuff. Firstly, we can see many of the early menu graphics we went over earlier, like the pineapples, which otherwise are unused, and there's even a reference here to a scrapped Glove World stage. It's believed that Glove World was later reworked into the Goolagoon Pier that we see in the final game. Next up, SpongeBob Battle for Bikini Bottom has a total of four video clips that go unused. Two of these are just clips of logos fading in and out, the first just being the Heavy Iron Studios logo, and the second having it joined by the logos of THQ, Renderware, and Nickelodeon Games. Nothing too crazy. And then the other two clips are left over from a completely different game that I bet you will never guess what it is! Okay, yeah, it's the Scooby-Doo game again. The first of these is again a logo video for Heavy Iron Studios, and the second is just the intro video from the Scooby-Doo game. My god, these graphics have not aged well. I guess that since these videos were already complete from developing the Scooby-Doo game, they might have served as a placeholder intro clip for this game until the proper Spongebob ones were made. So I've been beating around the kelp a lot this video for this, but now it's finally time to fully address it. This of course is the fairly well-known scrapped phase from the fight with Spongebob Steel Pants. This phase would have featured Robo Spongebob with anchor arms and a Speedo. Based on its appearance, this phase is thought to have been planned to occur after defeating the boss for the first time. The fight was apparently to have the player throw scattered bits of rubble at the anchor arms to pop them, and as such, it seems Patrick was intended to be the character for this fight as he is the only one that can throw them. Several characters are seen on the sidelines of this fight, including some like Mr. Krabs, who aren't seen in any of the phases that are used. Now, I don't know about you guys, but this is certainly some nightmare fuel right here. You might have put two and two together by now, but these arms use that part of that otherwise unused texture I mentioned earlier. But in addition to that, there are also apparently some scrapped dumbbell and weight models that were meant to be used here too. Now this fight is actually tougher to hack in, as unless certain specific files are removed from the game, trying to force the game to load this phase will simply just cause it to crash. Interestingly, this scrapped phase could be shortly seen in a trailer for the game on the bonus disc that came with certain versions of Mario Kart Double Dash. It's only seen for a few seconds, so blink and you might miss it. And now for the last stop of this video, finally my favorite part, let's talk about this game's unused levels. Battle for Bikini Bottom has three unused levels, or I guess really two unique unused levels for us to see. That's because the first two of these are both early versions of the Goo Lagoon stage. Listed amongst the files of the Goo Lagoon level as New Folder and Working, these two earlier builds of the level have a build date of May 11th and May 12th respectively. The final version of the Goo Lagoon level has a build date of September 18th of that same year, so this puts these early versions a good four months earlier than the final. Right away, it's clear this is unfinished. The lighting is different, textures are off, sound effects are missing, you can easily walk out to areas you aren't supposed to, and these levels are very unstable and they crash a lot. Since the two early versions of Goo Lagoon are only a day apart, they are virtually the same. That said, these early stages contain a bunch of interesting stuff. First of all, it doesn't take long to realize that this early version ends up using a lot of the otherwise unused models and textures we went over earlier. 
We can see the early Thunder and Flying Tiki models, the Fat Fish Fella, the original hint sign with Gary, the push texture, the soccer balls are apparently supposed to have appeared here, but for some reason they appear invisible, and even the toll gate here has the original early unused model. Now half of the time it was fun to explore this early version and see glitches like being able to walk under the water here. Wait, we're already underwater. But the other half of the time was really frustrating since the game would basically crash like every few minutes. And then the last unused level is Patrick's real intended dream level known as Screaming for Ice Cream. Now this was intended to be a part of the Spongebob's dream stage, similar to how Mr. Crab, Sandy, and Squidward each got their own level, whereas the final product of Patrick's dream was just a dark void with him standing in the middle. Anyways, right off the bat, it's no shocker that this unused level is quite unfinished. Not only is it lacking a skybox, which makes everything look that much more like a fever dream, but several of the models appear messed up as well, and this slowly moving spoon is pretty janky. Interestingly, this stage is only left over in the GameCube and Xbox versions, as it was removed in the PS2 one. It's overall a pretty short stage, which has you jumping around various desserts like ice cream, cupcakes, and more. Just like the early Goolagoon levels, here too we can see some early, otherwise unused graphics like the Tiki's here. And towards the end of the stage, there's even a golden spatula left over, which can still be collected, allowing you to basically 101% the game, or 201% if you use certain cheats. Then around this area are what look like large onion slices, as well as tiny little pickles, both of which actually hurt you. I guess Patrick truly thinks that vegetables are evil. Then also there's this strange ascending line of enemy robots as well as other NPCs including several fish and even Larry. The robots can be destroyed, but outside of just reacting to being attacked by the player, the other NPCs can't be interacted with. Whether these NPCs were intended to be placed somewhere in the stage, or if this was just some sort of testing feature, is unclear. Then lastly, after jumping onto these banana-shaped platforms back towards the start, you can actually warp to Patrick's Mind, which is the area that is used in the final game. This makes it seem that rather than this stage being a replacement to what was used, it would have been more so a stepping stone to get there. I think it's a shame this section wasn't implemented, as I think it's rather unfair that the other characters get such cool dream stages while Patrick got shafted. Now apparently the developers of the rehydrated remake of this game have said that previously cut content from the original is going to be added in. I'm really excited to see what's going to be added. I doubt stuff like the unused dialogue will be added in, but it'd be cool to see the scrapped Patrick's dream stage return or the unused phase in the Robo Spongebob fights. I guess only time will tell. And with that wraps up this Battle for Bikini Bottom Lost Bits video, and I hope you enjoyed. As always, if you did, be sure to drop a like down below and check out some more of my Lost Bits videos like the one I made on Mario Party 3 by clicking on the card right here. Also, be sure to subscribe here for future videos, swing by my other social media things which are all linked down in the description below, and if you want to support the channel, check out my merch over at tetrabitgaming.com, or consider becoming the latest member of the Bit Club to get some nifty extra channel perks like being able to see videos early. Click on that join button below for more information. Anyways guys, thank you so much for tuning in, and I will see you in a bit.